I'm going to talk about uh, science of climate change. I understand that there's a few natural scientists in the room, uh, so you will have heard uh, this, no doubt, at some point. The reason that I start with uh, the science of climate change in a class on the economics of climate change is um, twofold. First, you have to understand the problem before you can hope to solve it, right? There's a lot of policies out there that actually solve imaginary problems or solve a different problem than they purport uh, to solve. Uh, so I think it's important that you understand the mechanisms um, before you can talk about uh, possible solutions. Uh, so that is one reason. And the other reason is that uh, every single one of you will have picked up some things about climate change in the news. Um, <laughs> And uh, a lot of people seem to think they know a lot uh, about climate change, but uh, if you probe a little bit deeper, then it actually turns out that most people don't really understand. And that is because, I mean, if you go uh, onto the internet, you can find any amount of nonsense about climate change. But this is also true for newspapers, and this is also true for television, and even uh, supposedly high quality news sources like the BBC or The Guardian, uh, very regularly talk complete shite if it comes to climate change. And therefore, uh, I think it's important that we are sort of put all on the same page uh, before we start talking uh, about uh, the economics. So that's what I'm going to do uh, in the next half hour uh, or so. Um, so you're looking at nine different graphs that uh, are actually very closely related uh, to each other. Uh, on the left, in uh, the bigger graphs, you're looking at the atmospheric concentration of the three most uh, important anthropogenic greenhouse gases, that's carbon dioxide, that's methane, and that's nitrous oxide, uh, over the last uh, 12,000 years, that is since the start of the agricultural revolu revolution. Uh, and what you see uh, is that concentrations were roughly constant, um, through most of the period, uh, and then towards the end, they skyrocket. Uh, that is partly an optical illusion as to do with the scale. If you look at the small insets, we're looking at the atmospheric concentration of the same uh, free greenhouse gases, uh, but now since the start of the Industrial Revolution. And what you see is that uh, these concentrations haven't skyrocketed, but they're just rising, just rising uh, exponentially. Since they started at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, it's sort of, you can correctly assume that the Industrial Revolution had something to do with this, and this has to do with the expansion uh, of economic activity, particularly industrial activity, uh, and the increase in the number uh, of people. You may wonder, how do we know the atmospheric concentration of anything a thousand years ago, before there was chemistry? Uh, let alone 10,000 years ago, right? People were unable to write uh, at that point in time, so how could they uh, have possibly recorded this? Um, this actually comes from uh, air that is trapped uh, in ice. So what happens in Greenland, what happens in uh, Antarctica is that you have snowfall, and if you drill into the ice sheet in uh, Greenland, you find go deeper and deeper and deeper and you encounter older and older and older ice but snow is fluffy and that means that there's also air trapped in the ice so if you drill deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper you encounter small bubbles of air and that is pretty old air right and they've uh, in recent times analyzed uh, that air for uh, its composition and that is where uh, <coughs> these numbers come from so these are uh, yes, greenhouse gases. On the right, you're looking at, uh, at the top, the global mean surface air temperature uh, from 1850 uh, to almost today. And what you see is that the temperature has gone up. The second graph uh, has the level of the sea, and that has also gone up. Uh, and those two are perfectly consistent with one another for reasons I'll come back to later. Um, and at the bottom, uh, again, perfectly consistent. If it gets warmer, you would expect uh, less snow. And that is also what we've seen, uh, at least on the northern uh, hemisphere. 
to understand that this is a consistent uh, story, uh, we have to talk about uh, the greenhouse effect. And I'm going to talk about the natural greenhouse effect first. So this is a schematic. Uh, this is planet Earth. That's the sun. This is not uh, at scale. The sun radiates a lot of energy, most of it in the visible part of the spectrum. It's light uh, at day, right? Most of the, the energy from the sun goes into outer space, right? But a small fraction uh, actually uh, reaches uh, planet Earth. And it's a tiny fraction because we are pretty small relative uh, to the sun, right? Um, now, some of that uh, solar energy uh, is sort of reflected back at the top of the atmosphere. Some of it is reflected back uh, at uh, the uh, surface of the planet. And some of it, uh, actually most of it, is absorbed by the Earth. Now, the story cannot end there, right? Because if it were the case that the planet absorbs solar energy, and that's the only thing that is going on, then planet Earth would have evaporated billions of years ago, right? We cannot just absorb energy. We, or the planet, has to re-emit uh, that energy. Now, you have probably noticed that it's dark at night, right? The Earth, uh, the ground beneath your feet does not light up at night. So, planet Earth does not emit energy in the visible part of the spectrum, right? Uh, planet Earth emits energy in the infrared part of the spectrum. And that is where greenhouse gases uh, come in. Greenhouse gases are defined as gases, you may have guessed, uh, that are transparent to visible light, but opaque to infrared radiation. So if there's a CO2 molecule that is floating around in the atmosphere, and it gets hit by a ray of solar light, nothing happens. The ray just passes through as if the CO2 isn't there. If that same molecule of CO2 is hit by a ray of infrared radiation, that energy is absorbed by the molecule. So that is what we mean by opaque, right? Now again, the story cannot end there, right? I mean, if a molecule is hit by a uh, ray of energy and it gets absorbed that and it gets excited, as uh, chemists uh, call it, if that were the end of the story, then all those molecules would have evaporated a long time ago, which they haven't. Evaporation is not the right term here. So the molecule then gets back to its base state, re-emitting the energy it had just absorbed. But there is the crux of the story. That energy is re-emitted in a random direction. So whereas the infrared radiation from the Earth is all going towards outer space, the infrared radiation of the greenhouse gases that float around in the atmosphere, some of it goes to outer space, some of it stays in the atmosphere, some of it goes back to uh, the surface of the planet. And that means that on balance, it is easier for energy to enter the planet, if there's greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, than it is to leave the planet. In equilibrium, the two fluxes must be the same, on average, but if it's easier for energy to enter the planet than to leave the planet, then in equilibrium the planet must have more energy. That is, it is warmer. Without the greenhouse effect, people reckon the planet would not be what it is at the moment, around 15 degrees Celsius on average, but it would be minus 15. It would be 30 degrees colder. And that, of course, would imply that human life is not possible, right? Now, this is pretty old physics, and uh, the greenhouse effect was first uh, experimentally shown by uh, Fourier, he of the transform in 1827. Uh, the physics were basically fully described by John Tyndall in the 1860s. This is old, well-established science. If you don't believe uh, this, there's plenty of uh, videos on YouTube that show you how to redo Fourier's experiments in your kitchen. 
If you don't believe it, just go do it, right? And show, prove to yourself that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So this is the natural greenhouse uh, effect. Because there are greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the planet is warmer than it otherwise would have been. Now what have we been doing over the last 250 years? We have been stuffing more of these things into uh, the atmosphere. So you would expect that, just based on very simple physical reasoning, that the planet would get warmer, right? That's a very direct physical uh, link, and that is what we have observed, right? The planet uh, has gotten warmer. Now, this is not the end of the story, right? If this were the end of the story, there would be not the big uh, belly who uh, about uh, climate change. It's not the end of the story because it is, uh, there's so many uh, additional things going on. So what you're looking at here is a slightly complex uh, picture. Uh, what you're looking at is radiative forcing, uh, so that's essentially the change in radiative balance of the planet since uh, pre-industrial times. So this is a cumulative effect. Uh, a lot of people equate uh, climate change with carbon dioxide, that is completely wrong. Carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas. You see that there at the top, and its radiative forcing is 1.7. Uh, radiative forcing is measured in watts. That's an energy uh, unit per meter squared. So it is a flux of energy, and this is the additional energy that is put into uh, the planet. Uh, but CO2 is by far not the only greenhouse gas. There's methane, as I said. There's laughing gas, as I said. There's the halo carbons, the CFCs, the PFCs, as of six. HFCs, not to forget. They've changed and they've added uh, to uh, the anthropogenic greenhouse effect. Through the fertilization of agriculture and through transport, we've also created a lot of ozone near the surface. And ozone is a greenhouse gas, and that has led to warming and additional warming. And, and at the same time, we've been destroying a lot of ozone in the stratosphere, about 10 kilometers above our heads, um, because ozone is a great greenhouse gas. That has led to cooling. We've changed the color of the planet in two ways. One, we've chopped down a whole lot of trees or burned them and replaced them with grasslands. If you look at the surface of the planet from a satellite, from an aeroplane, then forests are dark and therefore absorb a lot of energy, whereas grassland is much lighter and therefore absorbs less energy. So that leads to a net cooling, and that is what you see here. And at the same time, what we've done is put a lot of uh, black carbon, that's the technical term for soot, on uh, the snow cover. And that, of course, then leads to a darkening and warming. And then we have put all sorts of uh, particles into the atmosphere. Uh, they're in the atmosphere, they're called aerosols. They lead to a direct cooling effect because they scatter sunlight, and they also uh, affect cloud formation. Uh, and therefore also affect the climate, right? And then the sun is also done a little. Now if you add up all these effects, you find the bar that is here. These are all the human effects uh, on climate over the last uh, 200 years or so. And what you see is that the total is very similar to just CO2, but the story is far more complex than just CO2. It just so happens that all these other things roughly cancel against one another. But that is just happenstance. There's no structural reason why that would be the case. So the story is a lot more complicated uh, than just uh, CO2. And CO2 in itself is actually also a pretty complicated story. Um, this is a, a simple schematic of the carbon cycle. Uh, this confuses a lot of people, and maybe some people want to be confused about this. Uh, what we're looking at are boxes and arrows, right? Uh, the boxes are stocks, the arrows are uh, fluxes, annual flows of uh, carbon dioxide uh, measured in uh, gigatons of carbon or billion tons of carbon. Uh, let's just start with the vegetation. Um, <coughs> so what's going to happen in a few weeks' time, uh, perhaps a bit longer, uh, is that leaves will start growing back uh, on the trees, right? And plants will start growing again. Um, and what that does, I mean plants are carbohydrates essentially, they, through photosynthesis, uh, get a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and the annual flux of that, of the regrowing of the vegetation, 
uh, is worth about uh, 120 gigatons of carbon. Uh, and then in fall, leaves start falling off the trees, plants start dying back. A lot of that carbon is uh, released again into the atmosphere, uh, and that flux is also about 120. The, the, the reason that this works like this, this is terrestrial vegetation, is because there is so much more land on the northern hemisphere than on the southern hemisphere. Right? That's why this is not the seasons don't just cancel out. So that is the annual flux from the of CO2 uh, from the uh, vegetation. This graph is for the year 2005. In that year, human emissions from the combustion of fossil fuel were six gigatons of carbon. Nowadays, they are seven. They've increased a little bit. As I said, some people are confused about this. Some people want to be confused, right? Six is a human emission. 120 is the natural emission from the vegetation alone. The ocean does similar things. You can add another 70 there. So if the humans do six and nature does 190, how can we be possibly be? How can we possibly be to blame? People who say this just don't understand what is going on, right? Because the ocean, yes, emits 70 per year, but also absorbs 70 per year, right? And the net threshold vegetation emits 120 per year, but also absorbs 120 per year. Fossil fuel combustion emits 6 or 7 per year, but does not absorb. So we should look at net emissions, not at gross emissions. Gross emissions, humans are trivial. Net emissions, humans are not trivial. Um, so I promised uh, to talk to you about uh, stocks as well, right? Um, <coughs> So in pre-industrial times, uh, there was about 600 uh, gigatons of carbon uh, dioxide of carbon uh, in the atmosphere. Since the start of the industrial revolution, we've added about 165. That actually comes mostly from uh, the burning of fossil fuels. And here you see the relevant numbers. The total amount of carbon stored underground in the form of coal and oil and gas is about 3,700 billion tons of carbon, and of that we have burned about 244, so we have a long way to go still, right? There's a lot more carbon in the ground that you can burn if you want to, and this is actually an intriguing number, right? So this is what we've taken out of the ground, 244, but we've added only 165 to the atmosphere, and the remainder to sort of enhance on the story that I was just saying, the remainder has actually been sort of taken away by Mother Nature, right? Some of it ended up in uh, vegetation, trees have grown bigger, uh, some of it has ended up in the oceans, in the surface ocean, or uh, more actually in the deep ocean. And you also need to take notice of the relative sizes of these things, right? So the atmosphere at 600, the right, of presentation at 2300, it's, uh, four times as much, right? Uh, the surface ocean is 900, same order. The rest of the ocean is 37,000, right? This is where all the carbon is, and uh, what is in um, fossil fuels is actually relatively small. So this is to complicate the story, right? Um, so what do we have? We have more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We would expect the primary signal to be warming. We have that there's actually a lot more going on than just CO2. Uh, we have that the carbon cycle is actually pretty big and pretty complex as well. Of course, what happens if it gets warmer is that you would see different plants growing. Or plants growing faster, or we get drier uh, plants dying back, right? So if it gets warmer, you would expect things to happen here, right? We also expect things to happen in the ocean. And that would actually lead to an immediate feedback effect of your initial signal here on what is going on here. And if we take the relative sizes of these things, even though this effect is sort of fractionally small, it may actually be very important relative to what is going on there, right? There's other feedback effects. Uh, warmer air can contain more water. And water vapor is a very potent greenhouse gas, so 
So there you have another feedback effect. If there's more moisture in the air, you would expect clouds to be different. Clouds are just water, right? And clouds actually have a very ambiguous effect on the climate. You probably know on a clear winter night, if there's no clouds, it gets very cold. Whereas cloud cover on a winter night actually brings warmth. In summer, on the daytime, it's the exact opposite, right? There, no clouds is associated with a lot of heat. Whereas a cloudy summer day is much cooler. So you can correctly say that if the temperature changes and water vapor in the atmosphere changes, then cloud formation must change and must have different clouds. But you cannot immediately say, well, this leads to additional warming or additional cooling. It just doesn't work. It depends on when the clouds are. It depends on the composition of the clouds and the color of the clouds. It depends on whether the clouds are near the surface, where they tend to have a warming effect because they keep the warmth of the planet in, or clouds that are further higher up in the atmosphere, uh, where they're closer to the sun and actually they function more to keep the heat of the sun out. Right? All of these things uh, strongly depend. And all of these feedbacks uh, kick in, which means that your sort of the simple story, more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere must lead to warming. It is much, 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 much more complicated than that. And in order to study these things, people have built uh, so-called general circulation models. These are large complex models. They are among the most complex models uh, known to uh, humans. Uh, and what they do is based roughly on the physics, on the physical understanding of everything, uh, built uh, as good a rep uh, representation of the climate system uh, as possible, including the feedbacks I just sketched uh, for you and many others uh, besides. Should we trust these models uh, before I tell you what do these models tell us? Uh, there's again nine pictures uh, on this graph. Uh, you've seen this one before. This is the observed global mean surface air temperature. Uh, and then we split it between the land part of the planet and the ocean part of the planet. So the black is the observation. And then we split it for the nine inhabited uh, continents. So that is one piece of information. There are black lines. And, and then in pink, you're looking at the results of these climate models. And there's about 30 of them uh, on the planet. And what they've done is they started their model in the year 1900 and ran it until today and put in everything that they could possibly think of that might affect climate, right? And then what you find is, of course, a range of results because as I said they have only a rough representation of the physics, so the models actually disagree about how the climate would respond to many different things. Uh, so we find a range of results, uh, but what you also see is that the observations, the black lines, are roughly in the middle of what would be our expectation of what the climate would do, would have done uh, in the previous century. Right? So that is the pink experiment. The blue experiment is the same, the same set of models, starting in 1900, running until today, but now they've taken out the greenhouse effect, or they've taken out the uh, greenhouse gases. Ran the model again, and the result is the blue rates. And what you see is two things, right? One uh, is that the blue and the pink overlap through most of the century, uh, but start separating at the end of the century. It suggests that there is a greenhouse signal. The other thing that you see is that if you believe that carbon dioxide, etc., are greenhouse gases, then the observations are bang in line with what you would have expected, right? Nothing strange happens. If you don't believe that CO2, etc., are greenhouse gases, then you have a hard time explaining towards the end of the 20th century what we have observed. It's not impossible to explain it, but it is pretty strange what has happened. Right? The warming that we observe is pretty strange if you don't believe that CO2 is greenhouse gas. Whereas it's exactly as you would have expected if you do believe that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. Now this is no proof in the proper sense of the word or anything, right? 
It's not a statistical proof because this is not a confidence interval. This is a range of model results. But it does, A, build some confidence that these models are not completely crazy, and B, that greenhouse gases really do affect the climate. Right? So if we take these models, we run them for the 20th century, and now we run them for the 21st century, uh, the following happens. <coughs> First, in the past, you can observe or impute or reconstruct the emissions. In the future, you need to make assumptions, and I'll talk about it uh, after the break. And these colors, different colors that you see here are different assumptions about how the future might unfold uh, with regard to the pressure that we put on the climate. Uh, so that is uh, one source uh, of uncertainty, and then the ranges that you see is the uncertainty about how the climate would respond to that. So that's the range of different model uh, results. And uh, what you see here is that by the end of this century, and for most of you, uh, by the end of your lifetime, the planet would be one uh, to four degrees warmer than it is now. And if you take a wider range of scenarios, it may be one to six degrees warmer than it is now. Now, that is a global mean uh, temperature, not particularly relevant. What we're looking at here is the spatial pattern of temperature change for three different scenarios, emission scenarios. This is chill emissions, this is a lot of emissions for two different time periods, next decade, uh, the end of the century, the end of the life. And then uh, these are the uh, expected uh, temperatures uh, at that point in time. And darker means hotter. And you notice two patterns. One, uh, sweet pattern, right? Later is poor pattern. Later is warmer, more emissions is warmer. Uh, but the spatial pattern is that warming is faster over land than it is over sea. This is particularly relevant for humans because most of us live on the land rather than on the sea. Uh, and the reason for that is very simple, that the incapacity of uh, water is much greater. That is why the meteorological winter lags behind the solar winter. Right? It first gets dark and then it gets cold. So that is a pattern that you very clearly see. The other thing uh, that you notice is that warming is more pronounced towards the poles than in the tropics. Right? Uh, and models basically disagree. Uh, there's two other patterns. Uh, that you can see one is that winters are likely to warm faster than summers and nights are likely to warm faster than days. Now temperature is perhaps not the most important uh, thing. Uh, rainfall and snowfall is much more important from a human perspective and from a, a, a plant's perspective or an animal perspective. What you're looking at here is the projected pattern of precipitation, so that's rain and hail and snow and everything uh, together. Um, for one scenario only, the middle scenario of the previous slide, uh, for the northern winter, December, January, February, and the northern summer, June, July, August. Um, and colors means, I uh, mean, the following blue means wetter, red means drier. And the shaded areas, and that's actually the most important information on this graph, the shaded areas are those areas where two-thirds of the models agree on the sign of the change. Not on the magnitude, just on the sign. Now what you see is that there's a large part of the world where the models can't make up their mind whether it's going to get wetter or drier. I mean, if temperature changes, then pressure patterns will change, then wind patterns will change and therefore rainfall patterns will change. If there's more water in the atmosphere, rain patterns will change. So all models agree that rain in the future will be different than rain today, but they can't quite make up their minds whether it's going to be wetter or drier. And that is an important piece of uncertainty, right? <coughs> in other parts of the world, models are actually consistent with one another. We can focus where we are. And then what we find is that, it's, that we're going to have more floods and more droughts. Another source of confusion, some people think that you're crazy when you say because of climate change there will be more floods and more droughts, right? How can it be wetter and drier at the same time, right? You must be nuts. What, of course, people mean there is that 
because of climate change, we can expect more rainfall in winter time and less rainfall in summer time. Not so much of an issue uh, in the Netherlands, uh, in England, where I live, in southeast England, where uh, I live, we have a, already a problem with floods in winter and drought in summer, and both problems are likely to get worse because of climate change. And there's another thing that you may have noticed uh, in this pattern, and that is that by and large, rains are shifted towards the poles. Now, that is not so much an issue in the northern hemisphere, where there's lots of land, but it is an issue in the southern hemisphere. And what we would see is that the rains that are currently falling over southern Africa in our summer day and winter, uh, that are now falling over southern Africa in the future will fall over the southern ocean. Rain falling over the ocean is no good to anybody. Fish don't mind, right? Farmers in Zimbabwe, uh, Botswana, South Africa, Angola do mind, right? That the rains that used to fall on their lands now fall over the ocean. And we see a very uh, pronounced drying over southern Africa in the rainy season. <clears throat> and that would be a reason for concern. The rains don't disappear, right? They just fall in and for humans an uh, inconvenient uh, place. So that's rainfall. If the atmosphere gets warmer, then the oceans must get warmer as well because they have to be in equilibrium with uh, one another. If water gets warmer, it expands, and that leads to sea level rise. You may think I'm crazy, right? If you have a cup of tea, and you let it cool down, it does not shrink, does it? Not visibly. Have you ever seen a cup of tea shrink as it cools down? No, right? And it actually goes from nearly 100 to, say, room temperature, 20. Now, how can it be that if the ocean gets a few degrees warmer, we notice sea level rise? The answer is very simple. The ocean is very, very deep. The ocean on average is three kilometers deep. So a small expansion of the water column in the ocean, a tiny expansion of the water uh, column in the ocean, is a lot for humans, right? Most of us are well short of three meters. So only a 0.1 expansion of uh, the water column would actually be a three meter sea level rise. That's actually not what we expect. We would expect an expansion that's much smaller than that. Thermal expansion uh, over this century would add perhaps 20, perhaps 30, perhaps 40 centimeters of sea level rise. And then of course, if it gets warmer, ice melts. And if that ice sits on land, it adds to sea level rise as well. So that's the Greenland ice cap, uh, that's uh, Antarctica. Ice that floats on the water, that's the ice on the North Pole, that melts, it does not add to sea level rise, right? Don't believe me, take a glass of Coke, put in an ice cube, and see whether your glass overflows if the ice cube melts. So, that's sea level rise. Um, and then there's a few other things uh, that I need to talk about, and then I'll <coughs> give you guys a break. I talked about temperature. I said if temperature changes, then pressure patterns will change, and pressure patterns will change, winds will change. Uh, but it's not just that. It's also, if you recall the map with the temperature and the land sea gradient, that actually becomes stronger, and storms are driven essentially by pressure differences or by, uh, in a way, temperature gradients. Now, there's good news uh, about storms and there's bad news. Uh, the good news is that there's no reason to assume that storms will become more frequent or that, extra tro uh, that tropical storms, hurricanes, typhoons, those sort of things, uh, would expand their rains. There's no reason to believe that. So that's the good news. The bad news is that there is actually very good reason to assume that storms both in the tropics and outside the tropics will increase in intensity. That is, wind speeds will increase. And this is bad news. And the bad news is actually worse than the good news is good. Because if you look at the impacts of storms, they are actually less than linear in the number of storms. So if you're hit by a storm, a lot of damage done. 
if you then hit by another storm, most of the vulnerable stuff has been damaged already, and actually the damage is less. The damage of the second storm is less than the damage of the first storm. It sort of like levels up. The force that the wind exerts on your house or on the trees around your house is the speed of the wind to the power of three. And that means that a slight increase in wind speed means a large increase in the force exerted by that wind. And that means a very rapid increase in damages if wind speeds go up. And that relationship looks like this. And that is what we should expect. Not more frequent storms, but more intense storms. Yeah. Well, why is it that there is not going to be more frequent? Is it? <laughs> you think I know enough about uh, the climatology of wind to give you a solid explanation there. I mean, storms arise when uh, there is high pressure here, very high pressure here, very low pressure here, and then that energy needs to be equated again, right? Or if the, the, the may, maybe spatially, it may also be vertically, uh, maybe horizontally in the atmosphere, it may also be vertically in the atmosphere, maybe a, a pressure difference. Now, if it gets warmer, would you expect more of these events to occur? Why? Why all, all of a sudden would you have an increase in the number of high pressure versus low pressure areas? That is just not likely, but what is likely is that you, your temperature gradients will become stronger and therefore your pressure differences will become stronger, not more frequent, but more stronger. More stronger is not English. Um, right? <laughs> Other people can tell this story much, much better than I can. For those of you who are native English speakers, the proper name for CO2 is carbonic acid. For those of you who are native speakers of German, the proper name of CO2 is Kohlensauer. For those of you who are native speakers of Dutch, the proper name of CO2 is Kohlsuur. And the, the important word there is acid. If there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, then by the laws of partial pressure, there has to be more CO2 in all the water that is connected to uh, the air. That is, there has to be more CO2 uh, in the ocean. Now, this is an issue. So we have more CO2 in the atmosphere, therefore more CO2 dissolved in the ocean waters. CO2 is an acid uh, when it dissolves, so the acidity uh, of seawater goes up or the alkalinity goes down. Now, that is an issue because well, we are sort of clever, right? We have our skeleton inside us. Our skeleton is made of uh, calcium. Other animals sort of solve this in a different way. They have the skeleton on the outside, but it's still made of calcium. Why is this an issue? Rumor has that there are students who clean their bathrooms. If you sort of take a shower, right? Yes water drops everywhere and they then evaporate and then what remains behind is the calcium that was dissolved in the water and that explains why there are white stains in your bathroom right and in your sink suppose uh, that you want to get rid of that what do you do you go to the supermarket and you look at cleaning products and the range of cleaning products for bathrooms and kitchens and so on and so forth all contain acid right and if you don't believe me, go to the supermarket, look at them. They all have some sort of acid substance uh, in that. What happens if you pour acid on calcium? It dissolves. That is how you get rid of the white stains in your shower. If you have a more acidic water than anything that has their skeleton that is made of calcium on the outside, is in trouble. Right? Anything with an exoskeleton is in trouble. So there's mussels, oysters, lobsters, coral reefs, the white cliffs of Dover, and so on and so forth. That's all calcium. And because of ocean acidification, these things will have difficulty growing, may have difficulty reproducing, may experience faster erosion, and so on and so forth.